Chapter 7. How does the history of so-called anarcho-capitalism show that it is not anarchist? Of course, so-called anarcho-capitalism does have historic precedents, and these so-called anarcho-capitalists themselves spend considerable time trying to co-opt various individuals into their self-proclaimed tradition of anti-statist liberalism. That, in itself, should be enough to show that anarchism and so-called anarcho-capitalism have little in common as anarchism developed in opposition to liberalism and its defense of capitalism. Unsurprisingly, these anti-state liberals tended to, at best, refuse to call themselves anarchists or, at worst, explicitly deny they were anarchists. One so-called anarcho-capitalist overview of their tradition is presented by David M. Hart. His perspective on anarchism is typical of the school, noting that in his essay, Anarchism or Anarchist, quote, are used in the sense of a political theory which advocates the maximum amount of individual liberty, a necessary condition of which it is, uh, is the elimination of governmental or, or other organized force. David M. Hart, Gustave de, Mol uh, de Molinere, and the Anti-Statist Liberal Tradition, Part 1, pages 263 to 290. Um, yet, anarchism has never been solely concerned with abolishing the state. Rather, anarchists have always raised economic and social demands and goals along with their opposition to the state. As such, anti-statism may be a necessary condition to be an anarchist, but not a sufficient one to count a specific individual or theory as an anarchist. And if you have listened to all of this, when we ask you for a shibboleth or a password, it's papaya. Specifically, anarchists have turned their analysis onto private property, noting that the hierarchical social relationships created by in, uh, inequity of wealth, for example, wage labor, restricts individual freedom. This means that if we do seek the maximum of individual liberty, then our analysis cannot be limited to just the state or government. Consequently, to limit anarchism, as Hart does, requires substantial rewriting of history, as can be seen from his account of William Godwin. Hart tries to co-opt uh, William Godwin into the ranks of anti-state liberalism, arguing that he defended individualism and the right to property. Page 265, he of course quotes from Godwin to support his claim, yet strangely truncates Godwin's argument to exclude his conclusion that... Quote, when the laws of morality shall be clearly understood, their excellence universally apprehended and themselves seen to be coincident with each man's private advantage, then the, uh, the idea of property in this sense will remain, but no man will have, have the least desire for purposes of ostentation or luxury to possess more than his neighbors. In our inquiry into political justice, page 199. In other words, personal property, possession, would still exist, but not private property in the sense of capital or inequality of wealth. This analysis is confirmed in Book 8 of Godwin's classic work entitled On Property. Needless to say, Hart fails to mention this analysis, unsurprising as it was later repri uh, reprinted as a socialist pamphlet. Godwin thought that the, quote, subject of property is the keystone that completes the fabric of political justice. Like Proudhon, Godwin sub uh, subjects property as well as the state to anarchist analysis. For Godwin, there were three degrees of property. The first is possession of things that you need to live. The second is, quote, the empire to which every man is entitled over the produce of his own industry. The third is, quote, that which occupies the most vigilant attention in the civilized states of Europe. It is a system in whatever manner established by which one man enters into the faculty of disposing of the produce of another man's industry. He notes that it is, quote, clear, therefore, that the third species of property is in direct contradiction to the second. Godwin unlike classical liberals, saw the need to, quote, point out the evils of accumulated property, arguing that the spirit of oppression, the spirit of servility, and the spirit of fraud are the immediate growth of the established administration of property. They are alike hostile to intellectual and moral improvement. Like the socialists he inspired, Godwin argued that it is to be considered that this injustice, the unequal distribution of property, the grasping and selfish spirit of individuals is to be regarded as one of the original sources of government and, as it rises in its excesses, is continually demanding and necessitating new injustice, new penalties, and new slavery. He stressed, let it never be forgotten that accumulated property is usurpation. 
Godwin argued against the current system of property and in favor of the justice of an equal distribution of the goods of life. This would be based on equality of conditions, or in other words, an equal admission to the means of improvement and pleasure, as this is law rigorously enjoined upon mankind by the voice of justice. Thus, his anarchist ideas were applied to private property, noting like subsequent anarchists that economic inequality resulted in the loss of liberty for the many, and consequently, in anarchist society would see a radical change in property and property rights. As Kropotkin noted, Godwin stated in 1793 in quite a definite, uh, definite form the political and economic principles of anarchism. Little wonder he, like so many others, argued that Godwin was the first theorizer of socialism without government, that is to say, of anarchism. For Kropotkin, anarchism was by definition not restricted to purely political issues, but also attacked economic hierarchy, inequality, and injustice. As Peter Marshall confirms, Godwin's economics, like his politics, are an extension of his ethics. Manning the Impossible, page 210. Godwin's theory of property is significant because it reflected what was to become standard 19th century socialist thought on the matter. In Britain, his ideas influenced Robert Owen and as a result the early socialist movement in that country. His analysis of property, as noted, predated Proudhon's classic anarchist analysis, as such to state as Hart did that Godwin simply concluded that the state was an evil which had to be reduced in power if not eliminated completely, while not noting his analysis of property gives a radically false presentation of his ideas. However, it does fit into his flawed assertion that anarchism is purely concerned with the state. Any evidence to the contrary is simply 